Hi, everybody, and welcome. I hope you all enjoyed this morning's keynote speaker. I know I did. She was very powerful. And also had some time to, to visit our exhibit hall and sponsors. This workshop is entitled Telemedicine Best Practices, and our presenter today is the fabulous Dr. Mario Bielostowski. I also want to let you all know that this session will be recorded so you can rewatch it later at your leisure. So thank you all again for joining us. And Mario, take it away. OK, thank you, everybody, for uh, being here today and giving me the opportunity to talk to you and present to you about this uh, important topic, given where we are and, and um, how much care has shifted to um, telehealth and telemedicine. So uh, we're going to I just want to real quick, um, I have no disclosures. Uh, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest uh, with anything that we're going to cover today. Uh, and let me tell you just real quick a little bit about who I am and, and what I do. Um, so. I'm an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics uh, in UC San Diego, and I also am the director of quality and informatics at the Urgent Cares for Ready Children's Hospital in San Diego. And um, a lot of my work I do in informatics. Uh, I'm a physician informaticist at Ready uh, Children's, and then I also do clinical practice uh, in a pediatric urgent care that's part of the hospital. And I used to do uh, primary care as well in the past. So. I have an agenda here of what we're going to cover, um, and I, I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for, for Q&A, but at the same time, if you have something that seems pertinent and relevant to what we're covering, uh, feel free to drop in the question um, in the Q&A, and, and, and we'll answer it as we, as we go along. Uh, otherwise, again, at the end, we'll, we'll try to leave ample time for all your questions to make sure that you're ready to to go if you do choose to go into the telemedicine world, or if you're already there and have a few questions that you wanted to throw at us and, and see what we can tell you. So, you know, a lot of people use the word telehealth or telemedicine and, and they kind of throw it around. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the, of the basics of the, you know, what the words mean. So telemedicine is typically defined um, as the communication between a patient and a provider, uh, so a physician or, or, or a you know, nurse practitioner, uh, anybody who's delivering care remotely. Uh, and usually the, the requirement uh, is that it does include audio and visual equipment, although some of those things have been relaxed recently because of the pandemic, but in general, you are supposed to do both audio and video. Uh, and so that's telemedicine. So you can think of telemedicine of the act of communicating between two people who are not in the same place, uh, whereas um, telehealth is a much broader term uh, and it encompasses the whole use of technology for remote care. Uh, and I think whether you're actually doing telemedicine, right now most of us, if not all of us, are actually doing telehealth because we're, we're using technology to communicate with patients and do things with patients that we didn't do in the past just because of their inability to come into the office. Um, so I think whether you're really doing telemedicine as that one-on-one -on -one communication or you're doing more of the telehealth by reaching out to patients via the internet and your portals. Um, I think we are all doing a lot more than, than we think we are. Um, and obviously, you know, we cannot talk about COVID because part of the reason why I'm here is COVID uh, and why we're not all there in person. And the other thing is that, as you can see by this graph, which is from data from uh, Medicare, you can see that before the pandemic, they really weren't getting any claims data uh, for primary care visits that were not in person. Uh, so the in-person is the gray bar and the telehealth, telemedicine claims are on the bottom. And you can really see how with the pandemic, it went up and you know, there was a quite a significant drop of um, in-person visits. And to this day, uh, you know, most places haven't gone back up to their normal volume. Um, you know, telemedicine has kind of plateaued, uh, but I think it's still an important, uh, important piece of care delivery. Uh, so something to keep in mind. So one of the biggest questions is, you know, what can you do via telehealth? You know, why would you do this? Um, why not just have everybody come in in person? Uh, and then there are times when you'd really need people to come in in person, but at other times that it may actually benefit both the provider and the patient to be, you know, at a different place. Um, you save the time from driving, you save, uh, you don't have to find parking, you could be pretty much anywhere. Uh, and we'll talk about what anywhere means, but uh, there's some restrictions on that. But you can do routine office visits, both even for new and established patients, you can do sick visits, um, you know, behavioral evaluations, like mental health evaluations actually are lend themselves really well to telemedicine. A lot of mental health providers have 
almost switch their practice entirely to remote um, because there's not a lot of a need for a physical exam. Um, you can do medication management. So as long as your medication management doesn't require you to measure something in the office, you could still do it remotely. Uh, and you know, sometimes things that need to be measured, you could still do it remotely, right? So if patients can share with you their blood glucose levels, um, if they you know, can measure their weight, uh, if you're checking their blood pressure and they have a blood pressure cough um, that you've you know, previously confirmed and calibrated in your office that you can trust, you still can manage medications without needing to see them in person. Um, and so that is one thing to keep in mind. And a lot of places who do you know, speech therapy, uh, even physical therapy have moved to the online realm uh, because there's still the potential. Obviously, there are times where you know, it may be beneficial to do it in person, but um, it actually has enabled people who live farther away to access care that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. Uh, and again, if somebody's asking for a referral, you can do that evaluation remotely. And then there's the other concept of telehealth, um, which is the ability of a provider who either has a patient in their office or the patient's at home and the provider's in the office, they could also consult a, a specialist uh, via telemedicine. So it gives you access to specialists that you otherwise might not be able to access. So one of the, you know, one important thing to think about is the limitations, right? So what are our limitations with telehealth and telemedicine? And, you know, the biggest limitation really is the inability to perform point of care tests, right? So if somebody is complaining of frequent urination or they have a sore throat or, you know, they have flu-like symptoms, you really are not able to do those point of care tests, right? You can't do it remotely. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big limitation, especially with a lot of the illnesses that children can have. Uh, and, you know, just in general with, with sick visits. Uh, and the other thing is you, you have a limited physical exam, right? So without having the patient there with you, um, unless you have special equipment, uh, you can't look at their ears, you can't listen to their lungs. Uh, and even though there's work being done to kind of use people's own equipment at home, right? There's some applications that sort of use this special funnel that you can look at a patient's ear uh, or listen to their heart. It's not perfect. Um, and a lot of our families have actually, you know, difficulty with technology. So your exam may be limited. So you want to be careful that if it is something that you really need to examine the patient, you probably have them, you should have them come in. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, you may have great internet quality, but you're really dependent on the devices and the internet access that your families may or may not have. Um, and I think one of the things that has come about with the pandemic is the realization that there's a lot of health uh, inequities, but there's also a lot of technological inequities. Um, and you know, some research from the University uh, of Southern California in LA that they looked at internet access for, for schooling for children, and they noticed that there was a huge discrepancy between uh, minorities uh, versus uh, whites. Uh, and so again, you have to think about those things that when you do switch to telehealth, uh, if it becomes a big portion of your practice, you want to make sure that you're not creating health inequities by not providing access to those people that uh, don't have the technology. Uh, so just, you know, keep that in mind. And then, you know, we said that you could be anywhere, um, anywhere is in quotations, because it really does matter uh, where you're licensed. Uh, and you can actually, you know, you as a provider could be even in a different country, but it's the location of where the patient is in. Uh, and for example, you know, I, I work in San Diego and we were very close to, to Mexico, to Tijuana. And we often have the case that families live in Tijuana, but they usually get the routine care in the US. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that via telemedicine, via telehealth, uh, because we're only, you know, at least myself, speaking for myself, I'm only licensed in California. So I would not be able to practice in Mexico. Um, now, there are some states that have uh, reciprocal licensing regulations. Uh, so one example is California and Arizona uh, that you could practice, uh, you could see patients from Arizona via telehealth uh, if you're licensed in California. So there's some states that allow you to do that. Uh, you just have to be careful that um, you're, you're covered for that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, this concern about leading to, a, to additional visits or more tasks for patients, right? So if we're saying, uh, they have a sore throat and typically you would order a strep test in the office and do it and result it then and there. Um, you may not be able to do it via telehealth. And if they have to come in, then you're having to do another visit. Same thing if you have to do x-rays or another sort of study, if they have to go to the lab, you may be 
uh, risking or not risking, but you know, you may be creating more tasks for the family and that may be okay. I mean, some families might say, I actually like this because it was still a lot easier to see you remotely and then get my labs done. And then, you know, we followed up like it would have followed up anyways. So it just depends on the family um, that that can be one of those limitations of, of telemedicine. So if, you know, you haven't started with telemedicine, I think there's a few considerations that you need to keep in mind. Um, so as a provider, one of the biggest things is, you know, remote access to your EHR. Um, if you're going to be, you know, in the same office where you normally are, then you don't need this. Uh, but a lot of providers have uh, been working remotely. Uh, and so you need to make sure that they, you have this capability of having remote access. The biggest, biggest thing is a video conferencing platform. Um, you know, like right now, when you, you know, a lot of people talk about Zoom and, and, and uh, you know, WebEx and there's other, and we'll cover some of them uh, in, a few, in a couple of slides down the line, but that is really the key thing, right? So you need some sort of platform where you can join and the patient can join and you can do that communication and deliver care. Um, EHR integration, uh, it, it can be useful, uh, but it's not necessary, right? So there are ways to use, just um, give the family the information about what platform we're gonna use and either I'm gonna call you or the office is gonna call you and then we join the meeting. Uh, but there are places where it's all integrated into the EHR, the family logs into the portal, they just click a button. Um, so those things make it easier for families, but it's not necessary. There's plenty of places where they don't have integration and it works just fine. And the other thing is, you know, especially for school-based health centers, as you know, schools have started up again, if they start opening in per person, um, it's that idea of reconnecting with your patients and making sure that you know, you're still here, you're still open, you're still available. Um, and if you are trying to increase your telemedicine services, a lot of it is, you know, does become advertising because uh, you need to let families know that this is a thing that you're offering um, and they don't just have to guess whether you do or you don't um, because they might go see somebody else, right? So there's been a lot of advertising by the big corporations who've been doing telehealth for a long time, um, they are offering their services. Um, and so if you wanna keep your own patients, you might wanna be careful and, and make sure that you are letting them know so that they don't go elsewhere. And there's tons of guides and resources available for free. Uh, and I'll, I'll list some of those at the end of the slides and they should be in your handouts. Sorry, and I, I forgot one thing, the malpractice coverage. So most malpractice insurances do cover telehealth. Uh, but you might, if you haven't started telemedicine or if you just had and you didn't have um, anybody review the malpractice coverage, just give your insurance a call. Um, they should be able to tell you, but you want to make sure that you're covered. Um, typically, it is covered, but again, you just want to make sure. Uh, on the patient end, you know, there's not a lot that they need to do. Um, sometimes there is, depending on, on, on what platform you're going to use, whether they have to download some software or not. Uh, but you have to, have to, have to make sure that they have access to the technology, right? So the worst thing you can do is schedule them for a telemedicine or telehealth visit and never ask them if they have a computer at home or if they have a, um, a smartphone or something they can use instead, right? So you have to be really careful because um, I've seen it happen where families get scheduled and then you join the visit and, and they're nowhere to be found because, you know, nobody explained to them what was needed and what they needed to do. Wi-Fi, you know, you'd, I think a lot of people take for granted the ubiquity of Wi-Fi these days, but not everybody has Wi-Fi in their homes. Not everybody has broadband internet in their home. Not everybody has internet in their home, period. Uh, and so, you know, telemedicine, because like we said, the basic idea involves video and audio. Although again, some of those rules have been relaxed and you can do audio only. Uh, if you really want to do the truly telemed telemedicine visit, it does involve video so that you can see the patient and, and make sure that everything looks okay and not just talking to them on the phone. Um, Wi-Fi usually is recommended. Uh, otherwise, though, if they're using their cell phone, that actually turns to work out really well, especially if they have 4G. Uh, but again, then you're, you're limited by the area where they live, right? So if you have a lot of rural patients where the cell reception is not great, then you might have some difficulty. Um, and then there are times where their video quality is not great, uh, again, partly because of the, their internet access. So if they can send you photos, um, that can help you as well. Uh, and one thing that if I can leave you with today is that if you haven't been doing this already, you need to leave ample time for troubleshooting, especially for patients first visit. Um, and one thing is that I would encourage you to have somebody in your office who is well-versed in that uh, and equipped for that because otherwise uh, you will be spending a lot of the provider time 
which may cut into their ability to actually perform a visit. So you want to make sure that everything is ready for the provider so that they're not spending, you know, 30 minutes uh, with the family on a 15 minute visit, but they spend 30 minutes just trying to get the technology working. And then there was no time to actually cover the, um, the visit. And here's a list of, of available platforms. Um, you know, again, I have no, <laughs> I don't, have any financial ties to any of them. Uh, and I think it just, you, what you end up having to do is you should go to their websites if you don't already have one and look at pricing. Um, and then, you know, you, you oftentimes you have to talk to your health to, if you have an electronic medical record um, to figure out what platforms work with your EHR, if you're planning on integrating it. Um, but a lot of these are actually, are actually free. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you're still able to maintain HIPAA because um, a lot of the free versions, they're not necessarily, they don't contain high enough encryption to qualify for what HIPAA usually requires. Uh, again, right now, there's a lot of relaxation of the rules, uh, but you should try to think about the future uh, and make sure that you're still trying to comply with the regulations because eventually uh, some of this relaxation of HIPAA rules may go away. Um, and you know the, the, the website that's listed here is part of the, um, health and, and human services department. And I listed all the ones that they have there and I added a, an additional couple that are, um, they're still HIPAA compliant. They're just not listed in the HHA site. Uh, and there's others out there. So I just wanted to be, you know, give you a broad range. Um, and one thing that is usually recommended is entering a BAA uh, with any corporation. Um, a lot of these do offer BAAs um, and that just ensures that again, they're committed to protecting uh, the patient's privacy. So once you, you know, once you've gotten started or you're ready to get started, uh, you really need to review your existing workflows. Um, and what you need to think about is, you know, what can we use from what we have existing and, and, and change it, right? So for example, if you have an MA or an LVN or a nurse that usually did some rooming tasks, right? So when the patient showed up, they did vitals, they did weight, uh, they did blood pressure. Uh, they can still do some of these things, right? They can ask the family to, hey, do you have a thermometer? Check their temperature. Do you know what their last weight was? Um, so you may be able to adjust some of those roles and some of those things that they were already doing. Uh, and you can, uh, you can modify it a little bit so that it can work via telehealth. And, you know, one important thing that we often do is screenings, right? So a lot of you may be doing depression screening, um, whether it's in, you know, well child visits or, you know, just ad hoc. And you got to think about, are we going to keep doing this? And if so, how are we going to do them? And this gets a little bit to the part about having integration with the EHR, um, with your platform, because if you do have a portal, a lot of times you can have families do all the screenings and, you know, put on all their information and make sure their, their telephone is, uh, is up to date, their, their medicines that they're taking is up to date, and you can have them fill out these screeners. Um, you know, again, we also use screeners for, you know, well child checks for development. You can have any of those screenings be done uh, if you have an integration with the platform. But if you don't, then you have to think about, you know, how are we going to do this? Uh, are you going to be able to send this to the family in advance? Um, like if you're doing a, uh, you know, screening for autism, are you going to be able to give it to them in advance or are you going to have your MA or your LVN read it to them over the phone or via your platform? So these are things that you need to think about and see how you could adjust them. Um, and then, you know, you also have to think about scheduling, right? So how are patients going to get scheduled? Uh, how are you going to decide if a person needs to be seen in person or it can be seen remotely? And again, you know, these are modifications of your existing workflows, but you may also have to create completely new workflows that you're not used to. Um, you know, typically you need to obtain a consent to treat. Um, and how are you going to do that remotely? Again, do you have integration? Do you not? Do you just obtain a, a verbal consent? Is that enough? And, you know, we, we talked about vitals. How are they going to do it? Are we going to ask families to, you know, go get their thermometer? And then, you know, what happens when you're in a visit and then you realize, you know, we actually need to see you in person. What are you going to do? Uh, you got to think about the billing implications of that, uh, the logistics, you know, does the family even have a way to get to you? Do they have, do they have a car? Um, can they walk? Are they close enough? Uh, and then, you know, designing a workflow for backup. So I think backup is, is really, really critical um, that, you know, technology, I'm a big technology fan. 
but you always need to have a backup, right? Like things can, things can fail, internet can go down. So you need to have a backup of how you're going to communicate with a patient, how you're going to reach to them if, you know, they're unable to join the video platform, if they're, um, you know, their computer is not working. And then, you know, going back real quick to the consent, I just want to make sure to say that there are some insurance companies that require special consent for telemedicine. Um, so if you have specific payers uh, that you're contracted with, you want to make sure that um, you know what their rules and regulations are for telemedicine because, you know, part of it is, you know, with the drops in volumes, a lot of us have really struggled to stay open. Uh, you want to make sure that you do get reimbursed for the services that you're um, providing to families because if you close because you can't afford it, then our families are not going to be able to obtain the care that they need. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us don't like to talk about billing, uh, but unfortunately it is um, it is part of the healthcare that we're in. Uh, and so you just want to make sure that you are getting reimbursed for you, for your time and for your visits. Uh, so this Mark, is an example. Have, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we do have oh. a question on Hublot from uh, Melissa. She's asking if you have any strategies for discussing or assessing other topics like sexual health with adolescents or young adults via telehealth. Yep. We have a section coming up uh, about adolescents because that's pretty it's like its own beast. So yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. Other questions? No, that's the only question right now. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to it in a couple slides. Uh, so this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And again, it's, it's, um, you don't have to be a member of the AAP uh, to get this. They're, they're actually offering it for free. Uh, and it's an example of a schematic of, of uh, how you can handle this. Um, and you can see here, you know, if you start as a patient, you know, they want an appointment. And then, you know, they have the idea of the scheduler who also works as a screener and say, you know, if the, is this appropriate for telemedicine, right? Because that's an important thing. Is this something that we could do via telemedicine? If it is, then uh, they schedule the appointment and they send the patient login instructions. Again, if you have an integrated um, platform with your EHR, you may not need to send them anything. You just kind of tell them how to do it. Um, and then, you know, both the patient and the provider arrive uh, and they meet in this virtual room, this virtual uh, conference. Uh, and then, you know, you have your normal thing. You, you talk, you get your history, you do as much as you can. And we'll talk about what kind of things you can actually examine remotely. Uh, if you have any studies, you can still prescribe things and, you know, arrange follow-up. And again, you know, one of the things that you need to figure out is, you know, do they need to be seen in person? Uh, and if so, you know, does it need to be right now and they need to travel to your office or they need to go to the emergency department? Um, and, you know, sometimes people come into the office and you say, hey, you should have gone to the ED. So in that sense, it may be a little bit similar, but I think the, the one that's a little different is you literally are seeing them, but they're going to come back and see you again, you know, in a few minutes. So, you know, how do you handle that? How do you fit that into your schedule? Um, so again, you know, just real quick, um, not to belabor this point, but you need to figure out who's going to determine whether the patient can be seen. Uh, some places have a screener. Sometimes the screener can be a provider themselves. Um, and then, you know, will you develop an access acceptable list? So if you have somebody who's not a provider, not a clinician, are you just going to give them a list of acceptable chief complaints or reasons for visit? Um, and then, you know, is this person dedicated or is this the same as a scheduler? And then, you know, one of the biggest recommendations uh, to this date is to separate sick versus not sick. Uh, and they don't mean just physically, uh, they also mean it by time. So a lot of the recommendations are for people to split, like if you do a lot of well child visits that you split either the morning or the afternoon for one of them, and then this, the other time for, for, for six so that you minimize the chance of people being in the same room, uh, same waiting room with other people. Uh, and again, that may not be feasible, uh, but that's our recommendation. Um, so before we get to teenagers, I'll just kind of talk about well child care in general. Um, and, you know, Hopefully your waiting rooms are not empty, uh, but you know, again, volumes have gone down. Um, but you know, children less than two years of age, the recommendation is really for them to still be seen in person. Um, now, families are scared. Um, you know, they're hesitant to seek medical care. There are, a lot of them are delaying care. Um, so you do need to reach out to them and encourage them. Uh, but whenever possible, the recommendation is that well child visits should still be done in person. Uh, one thing that you can do, though, and a lot of us are doing, is initiating medicine, uh, you know, well child visits via telehealth, and then having them come in for those parts of the visit that 
can be done uh, remotely and, and you know, then you can just minimize it. So whether it's you know, coming for vaccines, which we'll talk about, or you know, for sports physicals, if they, there are some places where they literally did everybody's well child visit remotely and then they had a day where they would only come in to get their lungs and heart examined and that was that, you know, you were not allowed to ask any questions or anything because they really needed to get a ton of patients through at the same time. Uh, but the families had an understanding that they're, you know, they're literally coming to get somebody to put a stethoscope and, you know, check their range of motion and, and their necks and everything, make sure everything was okay to clear them for sports physicals. Uh, but it is something that can be done. Um, so real quick on, on immunizations, because it is a big part of what we do uh, with children, with adolescents, and even with adults. And, you know, once we do have a COVID vaccine, it'll be, you know, greatly important as well. Uh, but this is something from the CDC that they put out and, you know, it was a, it's kind of like an advertisement of how childhood vaccines, given the pandemic, it really went down. And it's really, really important to make sure that we're still seeing our patients so that they can get their vaccines. Um, and this is from a report from the MMRW, uh, MMWR from the CDC that they put out um, on a weekly basis. Uh, and this one was about you know, the, the vaccination rates. And you can see uh, this is talking about not influenza, so any vaccine that's not influenza containing, and you can see that pff, things drop dramatically uh, towards like the the later part of March. Um, and you know they don't have data for how we're doing now, but I can assume that you know it hasn't picked up completely yet. Um, and then you can see here this is like measles dosing, right? So measles went down quite significantly as well. Um, and this is another way of of looking at the number of, of measles vaccines. So you can see that. Um, luckily for kids less than, than, um, than two years, it wasn't as big of a drop, uh, but for older kids, uh, they're not getting their, uh, their measles vaccines or their MMR. Um, so, you know, this again, partly, you know, luckily a lot of places did keep their two year olds uh, or less than two year olds from coming, you know, coming in. Uh, but again, you can see the impact on the, on the older kids. And again, like we said, you know, you can do uh, drive-by immunizations. Um, I actually got my kids flu shot in a drive-by that my hospital was offering and it was great. Uh, we drove by, we didn't have to get out of the car. Boom, boom, boom. Um, they got their vaccines. And so that is something you can consider, right? So you, you schedule things for patients, you have them come in, you give them a time so you don't get, you know, a huge line in your parking lot. Um, and again, I mean, you can do these in conjunction with a, with your virtual visit. You can um, still bill for the administration of the vaccines. Um, but it is really important to make sure that we are still vaccinating our, our kids. Um, okay, sorry, we'll, we'll talk about the physical exam and, and uh, for the person that wanted to know about teams, we'll, we'll get there. It's the next one after this. But physical exam, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, what can you do? And you can actually do quite a bit. I mean, you can look at their appearance, uh, you can look for rashes. Uh, and again, this is just a, a sample of what I put in a lot of my physical exams and it should be in your handout. If you want to copy it, go for it. Uh, but you can look at the eyes, you can look at the color of the eyes, you can check for eye movement. Um, you know, if somebody has, you know, pink eye, you can do quite a bit of the, the eye exam for that easily. Uh, for ears, you can look at the outside. Uh, if there's drainage, you can often see it. And again, if the video quality is not great, pictures are great. Same thing for the skin, right? So sometimes rashes are hard to see. Um, but even when they come in person, oftentimes they, they'll bring a picture of the rash because now it's resolved. You know, if they had hives or something. So families can share uh, through their phone. So most of these platforms allow families to share, um, you know, just like you can do screen sharing when you're on a computer, you can share your phone screen and show uh, things in your gallery. Um, a lot of times you have to walk the family through it. Um, if you have some sort of platform like a portal where patients only send you messages a lot of those platforms already allow for them to send images so you can have them send that in anticipation of the visit um, you can look at the kind of the shape of the nose also if they're having drainage the mouth is actually pretty easy to examine um, sometimes you do need the families to use an additional flashlight but that's often not the case uh, they can just put the that's why cell phones work great because you can have them move it around especially with uh, younger kids that are you know it's hard to keep them <laughs> in one place, uh, you can use a, a spoon as a tongue depressor and the families can do it. And, and we had our, our colleagues in ear, nose and throat. Um, they did this and it worked great for them. So if the ENTs can look at the throat as well as they need to uh, via telemedicine, you should be able to do it as well. Um, the neck, you know, you can have a family arrange the neck. Um, you can see how they're breathing. You can often have the families lift up the shirt, the shirt for the child. 
Uh, you can make sure that they're not really working hard to breathe. You know, if they're wheezing and it's like audible via the telehealth visit, you know, they got to come in. Um, so for the abdomen, I think one of the most critical things to remember is that you can use the other person there to do the exam for you, right? So you can say to the family, go to the right lower side and press on it, right? So if um, you can look for distension, you can see how they're walking, uh, you know, you could try to see, you know, if, if it's a concern about a fraction, like there's an obvious deformity and you can see it, no need for an x-ray. Uh, and then you can do a pretty good neuro exam. Uh, so um, our neurology department does a lot, a large volume of their visits via telemedicine and they can get a great neurological exam. So it all, you know, it's all about communicating with the family and asking them to help you um, because you're not there and, and just kind of showing them how to do things. So yeah, the highly anticipated confidentiality, HIPAA, teams. Um, so a couple of things, um, depends what type of visit you're doing, but you still have to follow the confidentiality rules from your state. Uh, and so anytime you're gonna discuss sexual health, uh, particularly in California, you know, unless the teen gives you permission, the parent cannot be there. Um, and if you're doing a well child check, you know, even in the office, usually we would have the family kind of leave the room. So as long as you've done this in the past and you know, you can use the same preparation that you give to parents, you say, you know, there will be a portion of our exam where I need to talk to your teen alone. And uh, this is just to give them the chance of, you know, to, to that for them to ask questions that they may not be comfortable with everybody in the room, whatever it is that you normally say to them, you can use the same thing. Uh, and one way that teens can kind of ensure that privacy is to encourage them to use headphones. So we've kind of been using that practice and it's worked pretty well. Uh, I mean, kids love their headphones, right? They just want to listen to their stuff and not listen to anybody else. Um, oftentimes you do need parental consent, right? So if it's not a protected health information visit, then parents still need to consent. Um, you can't just have a teen who signs up for a regular visit, um, you, you usually need to consent because it's a family who's gonna pay uh, if there's any sort of copay or anything like that. Um, again, like we said, warning the families and then make sure you're still you know, maintaining HIPAA. And this goes for everything, right? And that, that goes to the concept of where your clinicians gonna practice. Are they gonna practice from their own home uh, or are you gonna have them come into the office? Because you, know, you don't want them in a place, yeah, you know, a lot of places are closed, but you can imagine like you don't want your doctor working from a Starbucks uh, and having a conversation that's pretty private with you while everybody behind them is listening. So even if you're wearing you know, a headset, they may not be able to hear what the other side is hearing, but they can hear your conversation. So you wanna make sure that uh, you're maintaining HIPAA. And again, for teens, you know, having them go to a closet or having them go to a different room, you know, that may not be possible every time, uh, but you really do need to make sure you maintain their confidentiality. Um, and same thing for results, right? So you can't just call the mom and say, hey, uh, you know, I have the results for your daughter's chlamydia or your son's chlamydia, uh, you have to call the teen directly. So just like in the past, you had a way of obtaining their cell phone, uh, you wanna make sure that you still obtain that because when you do, if you do have them um, go to a lab to get some labs, uh, you do need to be able to call them to give them the results. Um, so does that answer some of the questions about teens? I believe so. There are no additional questions so far. Okay. And if there are questions, um, we'll still have time um, at the end. Um, we're almost through the end, so we'll, we'll have quite a bit of time to, for, you know, more questions. Um, you know, I work in urgent care, um, sometimes in the emergency department as well. And this is something that you really, really need to be careful about. Um, you know, we, we talk about checking in with your malpractice, but you really want to make sure that you don't get into a bad situation where you weren't really sure, you felt a little uncomfortable and you didn't voice it to the family. So, you know, you're still responsible for your patients. Um, and so just because it's telemedicine, you still gotta think about, you know, what else could be going on and, and do they need to come in? Uh, and, you know, a lot of things, they don't need to come in, right? So I'm not trying to scare you. I mean, you know, we, for urgent care, we, we do telemedicine urgent care as well. And there's very few times that we need families to come in. Uh, but there are times where, where, you know, the complaint is just such that you need to have them come in, whether it's because we're going to have to do a, a urine analysis or um, we really need to listen to their lungs. Um, you know, that's with kids that's typically they want, right? If you're symptomatic, got to make sure your lungs are clear, got to make sure you're not wheezing. Um, but, you know, again, you can't force anybody to do anything. So as long as you're documenting 
you'll be okay. Uh, but you got to document what you've told the family and say, hey, I, I recommended that they come in. Uh, but yeah, the biggest thing is, you know, use your clinical judgment. If you don't feel comfortable at all, have them come in. And I think, you know, most places what they do is, you know, you can't really, you can't build twice for the same visit. Um, so you have to know that off the bat, uh, insurances won't pay for it. So, um, you know, if you, if you, from the beginning, see that this is not going to be telemedicine, then just tell them right from the beginning, don't spend 30 minutes and then have him come in for another 30 minutes. Just say, Hey, this is not something we can do via telemedicine, but I need you to come in right now uh, and make that clear. Right. Cause if you say, I need you to come in, well, that's pretty vague. I need you to come in tomorrow, next week. Uh, so you need to say like, we can do this this way. This really needs a physical exam. I need to see you in person so I can, you know, examine your child. Um, if the patient is in distress, then that's no different than when a family calls you over the phone and says, Hey, what do I do? My child is asthmatic. They're, you know, gave him like eight puffs of albuterol and it's not working. Okay. <laughs> you know, they need to go somewhere and, and probably at that point, unless, you know, you're well equipped, just have them go to the emergency department, right? Like you don't want to delay their care. Um, so if they're really in distress, don't delay care by having them come see you. And then you have to call 911. If they're not doing well, have them call 911, have them go um, to a place where they can get care right away. Uh, and then one thing to remember um, is psychiatric emergencies are also emergencies. Um, and, you know, I think the jury is still out there. I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, or, sorry, uh, anecdotal talk about uh, increase in numbers uh, in many places for behavioral health complaints and, um, you know, just more patients that are suicidal. At least here in San Diego, we haven't seen an increase in our rate of suicide, thankfully. Uh, but that does not mean that kids are not feeling suicidal and they're not feeling more depressed, uh, right? Because they, a lot of them are still not being able to go to a school in person. Um, a lot of them, um, part of their anxieties or uh, the difficulties that they have may be related to their home environment, right? So now, you know, the one place where they usually had an out was school, their friends, and now they don't necessarily have that. So, you know, it also goes back to my point earlier about screening. If you were screening for uh, mental health um, conditions, I would encourage you and actually urge you to keep screening uh, because if they're not coming in and you're not doing it anymore, nobody's going to identify those things. So you really want to keep those uh, things in mind. Uh, and again, this will be in the slides that you can get. Uh, it'll also be in the handout. It's a whole bunch of additional resources uh, that are freely available. It talks about different platforms, different workflows, um, how to transition from you know, an in-person practice to a telemedicine practice. But, you know, as much as we're talking about telemedicine, I think, you know, I'm going to urge you again, you know, remember health inequities and health disparities and just make sure that you still allow access for those who don't have access to the technology. Uh, you really don't want to uh, worsen the, you know, the health inequities that we already have in this country by shifting all your resources uh, to a different population uh, and then leaving people behind. So, you know, not everybody's going to be a good candidate for telemedicine and that's okay. Uh, but for those that are good candidates, it can be great, right? You know, you save the time, you don't have to drive there. You don't have to find a ride to get there. You don't have to pay for parking. Uh, you know, our, our patients tend to love it. You know, if you're going to see a specialist, um, because our hospital, you know, mainly have specialists, you know, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, I had to see, you know, my kids see a specialist and I loved it. I didn't have to drive them. I, we just joined the visit, we saw them, um, and then we were back at home because we never left. Um, so I'm gonna let you all um, ask any additional questions that you have. Um, I'm gonna give you the opportunity. I know that um, this is, you know, COVID has had a big impact and, and telehealth and telemedicine have had a big impact on, on practices. And if you're not doing it yet, you might have some questions. So hopefully we can answer some of those. Thank you, Mario. I, I don't see any questions so far, but I do want to give people the opportunity to type up their thought. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I want to thank you again for that. Um, and I do appreciate that you answered the question about strategies for discussing sexual health with teens. I think that's something that most of our attendees appreciated. Yeah. and. and Again, I mean, the biggest thing is confidentiality, right? You got you to gotta do your best to maintain it. Um, like we said, I mean, there's a lot of relaxation of rules, but, you know, if you want to maintain the trust from, your, from the kids, you 
gotta be able to try to offer them the best way and give them suggestions. So we, you know, we usually, um, you know, we even have an adolescent medicine department at, at Rating Children's and, um, and the kids do the visit. Um, and so, you know, you gotta make sure that you tell them that I'm gonna, you know, the same, same things you normally tell them, you gotta try your best to maintain that confidentiality, not only because it's the law, but also you need that because you need that report. Otherwise, then they're not gonna be honest with you. I do have a comment. Uh, somebody is just uh, thanking you for your presentation. She says it was a wonderful talk and very helpful. Thank you. And I see another question. Oh no, I don't see it anywhere. Okay, um, let me see. Another question just came in. How do you redirect parents to the child's problems? Parents seem to want to use the virtual platform to discuss their own significant and valid issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky because, I must say lucky, um, you know, because I, I do urgent care. So we technically, you know, we typically just do the, the one complaint that, you know, just like in person, I can have families, especially, you know, they see that you're paying attention and i think a lot of us you know you know we obviously like what we do and we care about the kids right and so we we're pretty open and approachable and that's something that leads families to start talking about other things um, i think you need to remind so one is i think the biggest struggle is that because families are at home uh and they're you know they didn't see your waiting room that's full and they didn't see um you know they're they're they're, they're home right so it's really comfortable for them they you know, they may not have anything else that they're doing right now. And it's just reminding them that, you know, hey, you know, we, you know, I do have other patients that are waiting for me and I, I want to make sure that we cover all these topics, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to do it in this single visit. A lot of the things that you're saying are really important and I, I want to make sure that we can get a chance to talk about them, uh, that we may have to set up a, a subsequent appointment. Now, um, if it's not even specific about the kid, I think then really you get a, you gotta just help them focus, right? And, and usually when they make the visit, right, they'll, they'll have a chief complaint, they have a reason for, for the visit. And then you gotta say, you know, you know I, I really wanna make sure that we have enough time. You know, you can say, you know, you, can, you wanna make sure you acknowledge them, right? You don't wanna just move on and, and dismiss it because that's, you're gonna lose the parent, right? Especially if it's somebody you don't know and it's the first time that you're seeing them. If you dismiss them right away, if you come in and say, you know, we don't have time for this or, so you don't want to dismiss it. You want to say, you know, it sounds like you're really having a tough time with this. Um, you know, it sounds like these are tough times. These are difficult times. Um, and you may actually have resources, right? So you can say, I, I, we have some resources that, that we have uh, for things that are around the community. At the end of the visit, please remind me to, to send them to you or to tell you where to find them or, or something like that so that you can say, hey, we're going to address this. But we're going to address this at the end. Uh, right now, let's focus on your child because I'm worried about your child, right? I'm, I'm worrying that you made this visit for your child and I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about it. So just like it's the art of, of medicine, uh, but, you know, it happens in person too. And you just, you know, sometimes it, it you know, they're telling you something that you've got to listen uh, and it, it's going to set you behind. Uh, but hopefully, if not every single visit, uh, because then that would be problematic, but you just got to bring him back in, say, this is what you're here for. Uh, maybe we need to see you in person, you know, whatever else you need to find, but you gotta make sure you still address the concern for which the visit was made. Great, thank you, Mario. Um, I do want to let people know that we still have 15 or so minutes left in the session. So please feel free to, uh, to type in your comments or your questions. Um, we do have one more question, it says, what do you attribute the decrease in childhood childhood immunizations to? Yeah, I mean, I think just from experience and looking at numbers here in San Diego, people just stopped coming in in person, right? So I think it's a it's a big fear of, of people. People have a big fear of contracting the virus in that healthcare setting, uh, which I actually the data doesn't show that that's um, that actually pans out. Like most of the cases um, happen in other environments, like people who are going to restaurants and like you know, packed indoor places. Um, so I think one of the things you really need to do is, is you know, reassure families um, that it is safe to go to your office, right? So again, 
as much as we're talking about telemedicine and telehealth is the reassurance that the office is still a safe place to be and that you're doing everything in your power. Uh, but you know, the other thing is people's loss of jobs may lead to loss of insurance. Um, so one important thing to remember is that you know, there really should be no reason why a child is not covered. You know, there's free immunizations. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, for adults, unfortunately, it's a little different story, but for kids, everybody should, should always have access to medical care. Um, and so just reminding families that even though they may still themselves be struggling, they still got to think about their kids. But yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we've seen is just people are afraid to come in uh, to the office, which is what led to, to the decrease. I mean, some practices in the area, you know, actually shut down initially, um, like early in March, at least here in San Diego. Um, so I think it's, it, it's access, right? Access to care, whether it was because it wasn't available or families were unwilling or, or you know, just scared um, to, to come in. I do want to let you know that the person that asked about um, redirecting parents to child problems, she says that those were really great ideas that you shared. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a question of my own that was actually posted in another workshop, uh, but I know that you mentioned um, talking or you talked about confidentiality and also um, about consent with minors. But have you had any experiences with or how would you deal with um, like working through any cultural or religious beliefs that may be deeply held in some communities? Yeah, I mean, again, that, that kind of goes to the same as, as in person. Um, oftentimes, what I'll, you know, what I do, what I always do is you always have a chaperone, um, just because, you know, some families don't know what's going on. And, you know, why am I leaving my child with you alone? Um, when I was in primary care, that never really was an issue, because they, you know, you, you've known them for so long, it's not a big deal. But in the urgent care, you know, there's a lot of mistrust. Um, and rightly so. I mean, you, you see things in the news about um, things that have been done to, to children uh, that are completely inappropriate. So, you know, for, for, for families um, that come from countries where, you know, th there's a lot of, of rules about, you know, touching. Um, so one is you, you want to make sure you're explaining what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, you know, you can never force somebody to do something, right? So if the parent is not willing to leave, um, you may have to figure out a way to do the visit in person. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you cannot discuss things that are protected without permission from the child. And asking them in front of a parent if it's okay is, is kind of not the best thing to do because they're just going to say yes uh, because they're, you know, they might have some fear of repercussions. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that you have to be really tactful with that. Um, but again, I think explaining things, having a chaperone, um, you can always have a telemedicine chaperone, right? So if you're in the office, you can just have the, the medical assistant or the nurse come into the screen with you and say, you know, they're going to be here with me. I, I think, you know, you really want to be careful. Like, you, you know, we, we do genital exams um, for the little kids. Um, via telemedicine, right? Like if, if the chief complains like, you know, penile rash or rash in the scrotum, you know, I don't usually have a chaperone for that. I mean, they're usually like smaller kids. Um, and, you know, we, in, in our policies, you know, we don't actually have, you know, this, this session is being recorded that we don't record, you know, we use Zoom as a platform. Um, we have a disabled, so I cannot record and the family cannot record. Um, and, you know, those are things to keep in mind, right? And that's also part of the reason why you may want to think about where your providers are at. Uh, are you going to have them come in? Or are they going to use their home computer? We actually allow providers to use their home computer. Um, you know, we haven't heard any complaints, had any issues. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't do a, you know, I wouldn't ask a 17-year-old to, to show me, um, um, you know, to, to examine the 17-year-old over, over, over Zoom. I don't, you know, some people may do that. I just, I wouldn't feel the, the most comfortable because, you know, I, I, it, I don't think I can, you know, how can you guarantee their, their privacy and stuff like that? But, but it, it's been done. I mean, we, we definitely have 18 year olds who say like, you know, I have a rash in my penis and, and, and we see them. Um, but I think it's just a provider to, you know, it just depends on, on how comfortable you would be with that. But um, for a lot of those, you probably do want to see them in person because you might want to do some um, SDI testing. Um, and so you just want to, 
you know, I keep that in mind. But yeah, I think there's a big, big difference between like younger kids and, and what families are comfortable with. Um, and so if I'm in my say like, I'm not comfortable showing this to you, would you go to the And you say, okay, well then you have to come in, right? You know? True. <laughs> okay. I, um, I don't see any further questions. I do want to give an opportunity for people to type in their thoughts again. Um, but I, I want to tell you, Mario, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. I, I want to say that most of our attendees did too, if not all of them. Um, I do, we do still have a few minutes, but uh, Mario, if you can put your contact information on the screen. Yep. There it goes. You have it um, there. Yeah, I think if people, you know, come up with more questions in the future, I think they, um, everybody, you can just feel comfortable to email Dr. Mario Bielosowski. I hope I said your last name right. Yep. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh um, one more question just came in. Are you utilizing any platforms for translation services or is it an, uh, um, always another employee that does that? We use, a, here at Rate Children's, we were contracted with a service. It's the same service that we use. So, well, two things. So we, you know, because we're a big hospital, we actually have, uh, interpreters who who work there and you know at least for business hours nine to five they're always there or after hours we usually use a service uh, which is like a telephone based service that particular company does have um, they they now have a option of having them join a zoom meeting um, so it, you kind of go to their website and, and you almost like copy paste the, the meeting ID and then they join is, is kind of how it works you can also still have them just join by phone. So a lot of these platforms, um, again, we, you know, I'll speak Zoom specifically, but just like you can join Zoom via, via telephone call, you can have the interpreter just join via telephone call. And um, depending on the platform that you have, you should have a similar option where they just join by, by telephone or you give them the, the whole meeting ID. Um, but yeah, you wanna make sure you have that ready to go because that might put you behind um, you know, I'm lucky because I speak Spanish, uh, which is, you know, one of the biggest uh, percentages of, of additional languages that we, we have in our practice. So that makes it easy for me, but not, a, not all of our providers speak Spanish uh, at all. Uh, and they, they use an interpreter and it's not a problem. But yeah, that, that is um, a lot of them to have a way to communicate, especially if, um, given that Zoom is such a large one. Uh, there's quite a few that, that you can integrate with Zoom. But you could also have somebody, if you're in the office, then yes, you can just have the, um, the MA or whoever usually helps you come into the room. Um, but yeah, even for um, American Sign Language, um, so that one, um, they do have to join the video part, right? Because they're gonna sign, um, but you can do that via Zoom or other platforms. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Um, we just have some comments as, um, just thanking you for the presentation and oh, um, somebody else is asking is reimbursement the same for telehealth as in person? Right now it is. So right now it is, it didn't use it in the past. Um, they, the government hasn't, um, changed that there. I think there, there's been a lot of back and forth and battling about how long this is going to last. Uh, but for now, you can build the same level of service um, for a telemedicine visit versus an in-person visit, uh, and the, the reimbursement should be the same. But uh, we'll see where this goes. I think a lot of people are pushing it for it to continue being the same because uh, you're still delivering the same medical care. And one of the things that will help is in uh, 2021, the ENM codes, um, so that's the codes that used to bill for services, are going to change. Um, and the requirements are going to be a little bit different and that might actually make it easier for for telemedicine right because when when you're trying to meet the points that you need to to build a certain level of service uh, it may be harder because your exam might be limited uh, but with the new um, new changes you may be better able to um, to build um, similar level of services without a, a full exam Okay. okay, we can I'm give people five good. minutes back of their time. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I think you answered all of the questions. 
Um, so again, Dr. Mario, thank you so much for your presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and for everybody else, thank you for joining us. Um, Mario's contact information is there on the screen, so feel free to take a picture of that if you need to. And thank you again, everybody. I hope you are able to take a lunch right now and of course visit our exhibit hall and our wonderful sponsors. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.